This video contains spoilers for the Devil May Cry series. If you are not caught up, this is your warning. This contains my interpretation of the characters of Dante and Virgil and the credit song Devils Never Cry. So this is entirely my opinion. Thank you for listening. So back in the early 2000s, whenever I heard the name Capcom, I would think of three things. Mega Man, the vast array of fighting games, and Devil May Cry. And one of those is going to be our subject for today's analysis. No. No. Oh god, no. There we go. Now for those who don't know, and it's probably two of you at this point, Hideki Kamiya, the director of beloved platinum games like Bayonetta and The Wonderful 101, originally worked at Capcom in the 90s and 2000s. He helped direct Resident Evil 2, and with that being such a big hit, he was offered a chance to direct Resident Evil 4. While his direction with 2 stuck with the horror elements, he wanted to make 4 more of a stylish action game. Because he strayed too far from the original plan, Shinji Mikami, who was producer for Resident Evil 4, told him that he should take his ideas and use them to create a new IP. And so, Devil May Cry was born. Tony Redgrave became Dante, the knife became an electric sword, and the screams of terror became shouts of frustration. Devil May Cry saw success and was a big hit with action game fans, especially with the music creating this foreboding sensation before ramping up into an adrenaline pumping, head bumping, toe tapping bop. After the success of DMC1, Capcom immediately wanted DMC2, and that... well... To make a long story short, while 2 sold well, a lot of changes made from 1 just didn't work, especially since the new director for that project had a team that did not work on the first one, and the replacement director, Hideaki Itsuno, basically did course correction. So to make up for it, he and his team decided to make one of the best action games of all time. Whatever shortcomings DMC 1 and 2 had, 3 was made as a valiant attempt at hitting that sweet spot of stylish gameplay. Many things were improved, including combos, difficulty, and the soundtrack. While the soundtrack in the first two games weren't inherently bad, DMC 3 just had a lot more to offer in song selection, including songs with actual lyrics. And we're going to be focusing on the most significant one, Devils Never Cry. But in order for that to happen, I need to talk about DMC 3's most important characters, the Sons of Sparta, Dante and Virgil. So if you would rather head to the analysis and not be spoiled on a 15 year old game, skip to this time right here. Again, this is my interpretation, so you do not need to take it as fact. With that said, This party's getting crazy. Let's rock. So to understand the meaning of the lyrics, you only need to know two things. That this is a prequel to Devil May Cry 1, and you need to understand the characters of Dante and Virgil. By the way, I'm using the PS3 version since I had already finished that one and wanted to get this video done sooner. I recently purchased the PS4 version, so I'll make my way through that one later. But not before Special Edition of 5 comes out. I'm ready to bury the light, y'all. Getting back on topic, while both sons possess the same powers as their father, both have radically different personalities, which most likely stems from the fact that their dad was a warrior who kicked the crap out of a bunch of monsters, including a demon lord, but then later died, which basically made it open season for the demon seeking vengeance, ending with their mother Ava getting the Mufasa treatment. Decades later, Dante becomes a red coat wearing, fun loving, pizza eating, extremely hard to murder demon hunter. In the beginning, he was all about taking them out while ignoring his own heritage as a way of seeking vengeance against those who killed his mother, but when he gets a chance to reunite with his older twin, he doesn't see it as a chance to rekindle any familial love. No, he's more in it as a chance to knock Virgil around while getting some beast slaying in. But then, this happens. Oh. 
foolishness, Dante. Foolishness. Virgil has no time for nonsense since shenanigans don't give him more power. The blue Oni embraces his demon side while leaving his human half to the wayside since being human won't help him become ruler and get people to kiss his feet. Like, seriously, anyone who crosses this guy will not meet a happy ending. It's most likely because he's heard how powerful his father was and wants to be just as strong since he was powerless in saving his mother. He seeks to become an all-powerful being so he would never be that helpless again. Or maybe he's cranky and just needs a nap, I don't know. But after Dante gets schooled by his brother, he awakens his devil trigger and goes to fight Virgil once again. From here, Dante begins to think things more seriously, realizing that instead of denying his father's legacy, he needs to embrace it. But unlike Virgil, who thinks honoring his father means slicing and dicing anything with a pulse, Dante knows that he needs to protect the weak and stop those who are unjust. He's also less of a jerk to Lady, which in turn makes her realize that there are humans that are more evil than demons, and demons that are more human than... humans. Now, the Demon Brothers don't completely hate each other, they are capable of working together. Once they realize they were being manipulated by Arkham, the game's true villain and Lady's father, they band together to stop him from taking Sparta's power and using it for nefarious purposes, even though Virgil was sort of doing that to begin with. There's also the fact that after getting sent down the tower, Dante picks up Beowulf, which was left behind by Virgil. Either it was a gift to help out his twin, or he decided to donate his sloppy seconds while seeking more power. Either way, it seems that styling and profiling is genetic since both of them can use this devil arm proficiently. But by the end, both sons come to the conclusion that only one of them can make it out of hell, so they have one last Donnybrook, ending in Virgil basically sacrificing himself to let Dante escape and protect the world. We find Virgil in the abyss of the demon world and he decides to take on the demon lord Mundus so as to live up to being the son of Sparta and avenge his mother. Too bad about what happens in DMC1 though. The red twin is torn up about losing his blue twin since he was his last family member, but he carries on to protect humanity and becomes one of the sickest demon hunters in history. And from here, he's not really as fun-loving and goofy again until he meets Nero, who is the son of Virgil. I mean, he still makes jokes and cracks one-liners in 1 and 2, but he becomes more aloof in those stories, most likely because he's matured and knows to take the jobs more seriously. Well, until DMC4, but that's a story for another time. Devils Never Cry was composed by Tetsuya Shibata, with the lyrics written and performed by Sean McPherson, aka Shooty HG of Hostile Groove, with David Allen Baker providing the counter melody lyrics. This song likes to use a compositional technique called counterpoint, which has two or more independent melodies performing together to make the music more dynamic, which makes sense in the context of the relationship of the twin Spartas. Separately, they can get the job done, but together, they're more effective. The song begins with an eerie organ playing a melody reminiscent of a fugue by J.S. Bach. It's followed by a women's choir singing minor chords to emphasize just how saddening it is that the sons of the demon Bugman just could not work their issues out. But then, there's a tonal shift. Suddenly, we go from a polyphonic Baroque cantata to, well, metal core. Nice. 
So judging by these words, this is Dante's reaction to Arkham's insidious plan, remarking the villain will never become the man he wants to be, Sparta. Dante will take out the demons he sends despite being part demon himself, and will choose to fight for freedom until he removes the Temen Negru. When he realizes that his power was not a curse, Dante uses the power of his father to fight for a righteous cause, to fight for justice and free the humans from torment of the demons. I also believe the light is a reference to his human side, which is supposed to guide him to make the morally right choices, something that our villain is severely lacking. When learning that Arkham killed Lady's mother, our protagonist wants to help her get revenge. Because of her dad, Lady suffered a deep hatred for demons, but once she realized that Dante wanted to defeat him for the sake of humanity, she lets him do his thing. Once the twins defeat the big blob balloon, Father of the Year is greeted by Lady, and multiple bullets. Sparta died long before the events of this game, but his sons know that if he were still around, he would have styled on all of these monsters. With him gone, he passed down the responsibility of protecting the world to them. The demon boys must go forth to save humanity or else there will be a mountain of cadavers. Hey! We're not there yet! Now we're at Virgil's side of the story. While his brother's is more gruff and hardcore, his tones things down and takes a more calming look. He believes that in order to keep things in check, he must receive his father's true strength. Once he has the full force of Sparta in his grasp, nothing will stop him. He can be free to do what he can. We At first, Virgil was denying his human heritage because he thought it made him weak. He thought that if he turned himself into a complete demon, then he would have all the power he needed. But Dante reminded him that he had to embrace both sides of the coin, to have the power of a demon with the righteousness of a human. A lesson he doesn't fully grasp until he gets put back together in five. He willingly chooses to keep his half of their mother's medallion, not just to seal the gate, but as a last screw you slash goodbye to Dante. The legendary devil hunter vows to keep fighting until he dies, letting the listener know that he has accepted who he is and will continue to fight to honor his father. And in the shadows lies Virgil, waiting for the day of his grand return. No, not that one. There it is.
And there you have it. Our demon boys really do care for each other. Somewhat. And this song shows that despite them being counters, they complement each other as well. While they could be overwhelmed with their emotions of everything that's happened to them, they've learned that to embrace their true strength, devils never cry. Even though they cry like a lot. Like a lot. That'll do it for this analysis. I'd like to thank you all for listening to me talk about these devil children. I also would like to thank my girlfriend for helping me with this script and fixing my poor writing. If you would like for me to analyze another song, go ahead and leave a comment down below. And if you haven't gotten enough of me, well, you can also go and follow me on Twitch and see me play a bunch of games and see what kind of shenanigans we get up to. Anyway, best wishes, and I'll see you at the next one. Still a song for a second